um, from each of the three writers. So we'll be starting with Kirsty Miller. Kirsty Miller is a writer and editor. She studied for an MA in creative writing at UVA and was a recipient of the Ink, Sweat and Tears Scholarship. In 2017, she founded Ache, a feminist magazine about illness, health, bodies and pain. Curses, Curses is her debut pamphlet and Kirsty's going to start on that pamphlet. After Kirsty, we're going to hear from Julia Blackburn, who, as I'm sure many of you know, has written 10 books of nonfiction, the most recent of which, Time Song, was shortlisted for the 2019 Wainwright Golden Beer Book Prize. Her family memoir, The Three of Us, won the 2009 J.R. Ackerley Award, and her two novels, The Book of Colour and The Leaper's Companions, were both shortlisted for the Orange Prize. Julia lives in Suffolk, and Italy, but she's joining us from Suffolk this evening, I believe. <laughs> and thirdly, we're going to hear from Rose Hyam Stainton, who writes creative non-fiction, criticism and prose, and explores women and the body in creative practice. Her writing's held in the Women's Art Library at Goldsmiths College and has appeared in various publications, including Pinup Magazine, Map Magazine, Noit, Days Digital, Love and V Magazine, and others. She recently completed a master's in writing at the Royal College of Art, exploring abundance as resistance and femininity through literary device, drawing on art and literary criticism, cultural theory and autobiography. So after we have the three readings, I'm going to um, lead a discussion around some interconnected themes. One of them is about place, as Genevieve's mentioned. And so we're talking about East Anglia as a place and why it might inspire writers. We're also going to talk about healing because that's a theme that connects the work of all three of these writers. And then we're going to also talk a bit about lockdown and how that might have reflected upon our, all of our feelings about place, environment and well-being. And as Genevieve mentioned, if you have a question that you want to pose, if you put it in the chat, um, then I'll put that question to the, to the authors as part of the discussion. So uh, please come forward with any questions you, you do have. Uh, so if we can go now uh, to Kirsty Miller as our first reader, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Kirsty. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to read some poetry from uh, my pamphlet, Curses, Curses. Um, and apologies if you hear my cat in the background. She's quite noisy today. Um, the first poem is called In the End. First comes the longing. The idea of four legs capped with hooves, and then the wonderful sound of copping everywhere we go. Consider the outfits. On the top we will be brave, on the bottom we will be more brave, on the bottom we will be the shape of honesty. Then comes the water. All the world is a great tainted river, and women are turning into centaurs. Women are turning into centaurs all over the place. We cut two extra leg holes into everything. The wind opens its scorching mouth, and we feel it all gloomy on our necks. The signs read, do not drink the green flood water. The plants are sadly dead. The animals are alive and hungry for revenge. We sip the green flood water from our bone china cups. The animals look on furiously. Our pink tongues lick the gold rimmed edges of their ancestors. Our bottom halves gallop with an ancient rage. Our top halves break out into a century long scream. It fractures off. It throws a strange, a strange light into the woods. The men are forgiven for everything. They still walk on two feet. They watch us swim in the river as our thoughts are threaded like her from skull to skull. Now watch us. Watch us raise up our fantastic hands. Watch us dash river water, furious and burning for belief, into their violent eyes. Um, the next poem from my pamphlet is a prose poem called The Institute for Secret Pain. A man appears, his, scrub, his scrubs are oddly glowing and his face is promising. He hands me a business card which reads, Director of the Institute for Secret Pain. I ask him, can you make it go away? His answer is, of course. At the Institute of Secret Pain, women simply sign their pain away. It's that easy. The building is large and it never closes. Pictures of women are on the walls. Their thumbs are up and their mouths are open wide. I think they are smiling. I count 68 teeth in total. The posters read, no more pain. And I tell the director, I sure like the sound of that. 
On day one of the Institute of Secret Pain, I attend an induction meeting. I sit in the lecture theatre and the, direct the director explains that pain is real, despite what the doctors told us. Ladies, your pain is real, all right. Would you like to see it? We all cheer, yes, 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 please. He turns on the screen and then we see it. We see our own animals. On day two, I attend a chorus recital. We open our mouth and scream. Our voices harmonize into a deep vibrating ball of light. The recital lasts for 15 minutes, after which we retire to our bedrooms. On day three, we line up and are told by the director that we must challenge our pain to a fist fight. Three women sadly die and one woman faints and has to be fed biscuits and sweet cups of tea by the nurses. On day four, we are instructed to unzip from our bodies. I am nervous at first, but everyone else does it effortlessly. And then so do I. The pain is green and deep and brilliant. We anxiously agree it is still lingering around our edges. The director says, ladies, tomorrow your pain will be gone for good. We cheer, we struggle sleeping because of the excitement. On day five, we are told that the cure is definitely happening today. We leave our bodies safely behind on the floor where we can collect them later. We unzip and stand there in a group all red and throbbing and sore, but we are told not for long. We are instructed to follow the director to the factory. Here we are promised we will finally meet our cures. Um, and the last poem from this collection is called Murderess for Lizzie Borden. When I was 13, I was you. I put on an apron and felt the fake velvet itch against my neck and felt the curious sensation of something heavy in my hand and felt how to put it to use. By day, a schoolgirl. By night, a murderess. And did I want to kill? You bet. The feeling was peculiar, one I hadn't yet named. I could pick up an ax and whack and whack for days. I whack through food, I whack through the phone call, the laughter, the dead deadline. What did they do to you? Did you sit for hours in your wallpapered room, the cabbage roses talking to you? Did you practice in the cellar on a sack of brown sugar? Did you put a lump in your mouth just to ruin your dinner? Did you giggle over the shell peas at your horrible little secret? You whack through your father and I whack through the homecoming dance. You whack through your stepmother and I whack through math class. Power splattered all up our arms, drenching our white dresses and our itching collars in a delightful rage. Then I whack through my own body. For one night only, I was you. And Lizzie, I was supreme. Um, there are some poems from Curses, Curses, which has some, you can't really see, but illustrations by uh, Alice Blackstock, who's a wonderful artist who I collaborated with. Um, and the final thing I'll read is something I was working on more recently, which I was writing in Norwich. So I think it's quite fitting to read. Um, so it's an extract from a longer prose poem. Day one, picture this, white fawn, spotless and new, running and suddenly punctured by a particularly sharp branch. Mother's salty tongue licking the wound clean. Three drops of crimson blood steaming in the snow. Blood is terribly revealing. Blood for the hunters to see and also smell. Picture this. The white fawn and its mother do not know the mistake they have made. Sadly, the hunter knows. Sadly, the sharp teeth always know. Later, the birth was painful, like all births. The agony sprouted from my side and raged and raged. Me on the bathroom floor. Me crawling, all hands and knees and whimpers. Day two. Too much withering on the floor. Too much churning. Pain all guttural and hot. Me on your table, legs parted and trembling in your hooks, naked from the waist down. You, a blue glove tanned inside of me, tugging at the birth, twisting the pain in your meaty fist, flecks of blood against the white of your coat. For your own good, you say. Okay, I say. Okay. Day three, after the birth. Doctor, I write this while bleeding in my little bed. I am sore, but I am feeling brighter today. I lean on my pillow and sip cups of tea with demerara sugar. Through the cracked window, I smell the cold winter sun. Decades of dust clings to my yellowed curtains. I rent a small bedroom at the top of a large house at the edge of the city. Their landlady is kind but odd. The house is full of fur coats. These quiet animals with button eyes hang limply on hooks. To reach my bedroom, I must walk past the swaying animals. Up and up and up, a long and narrow stairwell. 
on which a bright red rug stretches out like a tongue. The landlady has many sons. They eat and fight and throw stones at cats and smoke cigarettes in the garden beneath my window. I do not like her sons and they do not like me. In the corner there is a birth, fully formed and realized, a glowing egg. The egg cries all night. I cannot bear its noiseless sobs. I rock the egg. I cover it with a blanket. I tell it a story. I threaten to smash it with a spoon. Nothing helps. Nothing stops the cries. The landlady hears my anxious feet and knocks on my door. What is the matter, dear? Knock, knock. What are you hiding? Knock, knock. I ignore her and she leaves. Doctor, I am very exhausted, but I cannot sleep. The egg will not allow it. Perhaps you can give me something. Day five. I'm overcome by a strange memory. Although I've tried to forget it, I cannot. So I leave the egg in the crate and walk and do not stop until I reach the woods. The white fawn is here and I tell the fawn my memory. It is night and I'm running. I'm running wildly and purely. Each tree whooshes past my ear and my body is compact and capable and strong. The trees and snow smell delicious and promising and I am happy. Then suddenly a ripping, a hot damp heat splashing through my core. I feel pain with a sickening certainty. Agony, so sharp and ancient, rupturing me. I stop my delightful running. Tending to my wound, I discover a gash has split me open. There is blood, pulsing and chaotic and everywhere. I look down at the snow, see it is crimson, shimmering and horrible. The fawn watches me with intelligent eyes and slowly chews grass. I ask the fawn, what is it like to be hunted, to be harmed? That's my reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsty. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for starting us off as well. It's fantastic. There's lots of things that came to mind that we look forward to talking about in the in the discussion. But that was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so everyone's given clapping hands and things. If you want to say anything in the chat, please come forward and you can post a message or a question for Kirsty in the chat. Um, so now we come to uh, Julia Blackburn is going to read for us now. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, I realised that the book Time Song started with the Waveney of Light Arts because I went in 2014, it must have been, to a, a thing you did on Doggerland in Halesworth, the cut. And from that, when I listened to this story about the land that once connected this, this coast of east coast of England with Europe, which I always feel very connected with anyway. Um, it interested me as a metaphor. And so I spent about a year trying to find out more about it. And then after a year of finding out, I thought I would write a book, um, which starts with an explanation. And I'm going to read a little bit from that. And then I'm going to read the chapter at the end of the book. Um, and the time song of it is an exploration of Doggerland, but it's also of everything that has vanished. It's the whole idea of that sort of, of us being the last moment of this hugeness that's come before us. Um, and the first opening is me explaining what I'm doing, explaining what Doggerland is, but then asking myself the question. Of course I ask myself what on earth I think I'm doing, rattling around like a ghost in such distant landscapes of the past. And this is what might be the answer, or at least part of the answer. I am not especially afraid of my own death, but I am afraid of the death of forests and oceans, the contamination of water and air, the sense that we are heading towards a catastrophe from which there will be no escape. I comfort myself with the knowledge that this is nothing new, the climate has often shifted from extremes of heat to extremes of cold, oceans rising to cover the land and shrinking to reveal it in a different form, living creatures emerging in all their strangeness and determination to survive, and some of them manage to hold on, but others do not. I wonder now if it makes more sense to imagine infinity going backwards in time rather than forwards. When you look at it that way around, you no longer have the vague dread of what the future holds. Instead, there is the intimation of the enormity of everything that has gone before, a solemn procession of life 
in all its myriad forms, moving steadily towards this present moment. You can almost hear the songs they are singing. There is something else. My husband died a few years ago. He has vanished, and yet he remains close, beneath the surface, as it were. So perhaps I am trying to catch a glimpse of him within the great jumble of everything else that has been lost from our sight. And then the next bit is the last chapter in the book, um, where I go with my friend Jane, who lives up on the North Norfolk coast. Um, well, it explains itself, but it's the last chapter. 12th of February, 2018, and Jane and I have decided to watch the dusk and the dawn as they play out across the North Sea that covers whatever is left of a country called Doggerland. We begin at the village of Clay, which is on a stretch of coast near where she lives. It's not yet 4 p.m., but the sun is already going down and the luminous turquoise of the sky is streaked with red and apricot, buttery yellow and candy floss pink. We walk along a path that goes through the reeds but runs parallel to the road, and so we are accompanied by the strange animal growl of cars. I watch my own shadow moving beside me. During a brief lull of cars, I can hear sparrows being noisy in a bush and a chicken celebrating the laying of an egg. The path turns sharp right and becomes a raised track that crosses reed beds and swampy meadows and spreading expanses of water. Lots of birds. I recognize oyster catchers and something which must be a wimble, a few egrets, pochards with their wonderful chestnut brown heads, and a heron. A man heading back to the village is shouting into his mobile. He says, would it be helpful if we got hold of some recent analysis not sent by the original company? I write his words in my notebook. His two children and a black dog follow silently in his wake. My eye is caught by a moving flurry of white feathers on the bank that leads down to the track. It's the body of a tern brought to life by the wind, its head raised in a sort of defiance, its beak bright red and very sharp. We reach the shore, razor shells, oyster shells, whelps, a crab claw. I pick up a pale flint that contains a little picture, a black shape like the silhouette of the head and shoulders of a man, and next to the head is a rounded black bubble that could be his thoughts. It reminds me of the picture on the cover of this book, in which a 2,000-year-old couple, whose flattened bodies were found in a bog in Holland, seem to be walking convivially side by side, and one of them has something like a thought rising just above his head. They were found by bog cutters in 1904, a policeman was summoned and he rolled them together as you might a carpet and tied them on his bicycle and took them back to town where they ended up in a glass case in the local museum. By now the sun is burning like a circle of flame as it moves closer to the horizon. We watch as a tight mass of grey white birds with pointed wings swoop by with a rush of sound. Knots which breed in the Arctic but come south during the winter months. Their many bodies are held in unison, unison like a single body. They turn, and with the magic of their turning, they vanish. They turn again and they reappear. They dance out across the rippled surface of the sea, and they have gone. The sky's colours are growing dark and thick, and it's suddenly very cold. We are about to leave, but stop when we hear a disembodied, heralding cry that seems to erupt from a distant line of trees. The noise mixes with the sowing of the wind and almost could be the wind, but as it draws closer, it disentangles itself and becomes a chorus of voices. The geese fly low, directly above our heads, wave upon wave of noisy, warm-blooded creatures, the heaviness of them, the creak of their wings, the determined stretch of their necks as they make their way towards a place where they can be safe for the night. On the following morning, we get up at 3.30, we bundle ourselves into Jane's car and drive for an hour or so until we reach a bird reserve on the edge of the Bay of the Wash. It's still pitch dark and absurdly cold. I'm wearing a coat, a jacket, a hat, two scarves, gloves, and layer upon layer of t-shirts and jumpers. And yet when I step out of the car, the air cuts like a knife into my mouth and nostrils and into a small patch around my middle, which signals an untapped gap in one of the layers. 
We are quite close to where the River Ouse used to flow into Doggerland. We are standing on one side of what was a sheltered estuary protected by the Dogger Hills. We are looking towards Dogger Island before it vanished. The whole area has been built up out of the slow accretion of river, river sediment, so the flat muddy land and the shallow muddy sea merge into each other as if they were one and the same. But in the darkness before the dawn, all that I can distinguish of my surroundings is what is revealed by the trickle of light from a little torch. We find a path and follow it, not quite sure if this is the path we want. It is flanked on both sides by the looming presence of bushes and trees, some of which emit tentative fragments of song from the little birds sheltered within them. I turn my torch towards a tree and something black tumbles out of it with a clatter of wings. The path leads to wooden steps. We go up them and seem to be on some sort of man-made embankment. From this vantage point, I can see a pink sliver of moon lying on its side in the dark sky. I can hear the lapping of water, but I have no idea what water it is. I'm not even sure how far we are from the sea and how near to the shallows and mud flats of the estuary. More light, and although there is still no orb of the sun, the breathing warmth of shades of pink and fiery orange are spreading out across the sky and clinging to the scatterings of clouds. In the distance, coming in from the land, I can see a smoky procession of white birds flying just above the mud surface. Every so often they explode into a flurry of upward flight, so their whiteness is muted by the colours of the dawn, and then they subside and return to their ordered lines. They keep on coming, purposeful and sure. A different sort of movement is taking shape in the West. Again, it is like smoke, but this smoke is dark as it rises up from the horizon. The geese have woken from where they were sleeping on the sea's surface, and now they're flying in the direction of the dawn. I cannot hear them because they are too far away, but I watch these, their spidery lines crisscrossing the sky, sentences in a language I am unable to read. We begin to make our way to the car. Just before we leave the edge of the estuary, we come across a crowd of goldfinches. There are 30 of them at least, feeding on a wintry patch of teasel. The sound they make is like excited laughter. I suddenly realize I have lost a blue and white spotted handkerchief that belonged to my husband. I wonder about turning back to look for it, but that would be absurd. And so I leave it wherever it has fallen, and I can see it there long after I have left this place. That was four months ago. Summer had come, has come earlier than usual, and the succession of days have been relentless hot and dry. The sky is milky blue, and there are never any clouds to disturb it. The exhausted fields have faded into pale yellows and greys, and the leaves on the trees make a rustling sound when a soft wind blows. Yesterday I went swimming at Cove Highs. There were quite a few people scattered along the beach, but once I was in the sea with the low outline of Holland invisible on the other side, it was as if there was no one else in all the world. The wrinkled surface of the sea was covered with glistening clusters of white light that danced with the jostle of the waves. Because I'm an insecure swimmer, I did not go out of my depth, and every so often I stood my feet on the underwater land that lay beneath me. I was only there for a little while, and then I returned home. And I'm going to finish with the little, this, this book has got what I call time songs. I'm very dazzled by light here, but I can read it anyway. So one of the time songs, the very last in the book, is a kind of summing up of my thoughts about time. <laughs> Each of the songs, some of them are, are, are to do with sort of giving facts of the history because it's packing in a lot of thinking. But this is kind of summing up of the, of the thought behind the book. Time Song 18. Today is the anniversary of your death. And if today I were to write you a letter that you could read, even though you are dead and read nothing, I would say I have been looking for you and I have not found you but I have found traces of your absence alongside the other absences that rear up before my eyes like startled horses, a wave breaking on the shore, the moon shifting into view from behind dark clouds. I would say I have been comforted by the crowdedness of it all. And I would say to you who does not listen that time is both longer and shorter than I ever imagined. 
Land becomes sea, sea becomes land. Ice into desert, desert into salt marsh. Salt marsh into birds and fish, animals and people. Everything forgotten and remembered and forgotten again. Bone and stone, footprint and tree trunk. Beetle wing and speck of pollen. They rear up before my eyes like startled horses. A wave breaking on the shore. The moon shifting into view from behind dark clouds. Then I would say to you who does not care one way or another, I think it's all right. The world will continue even if we have gone. And that is surely something to smile about. So there we are. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. That was really moving. And I'm sure everybody was very touched by that. And again, so many interesting ideas uh, to bring out in the discussion. <laughs> Incredible, really wonderful. Thank you so much. And we've got our first question from the audience inspired by you as well. So we'll come to that a bit later on too. Yep. Brilliant, thank you so much. And so now we'll come on to Rose, um, who's gonna read for us uh, for our third reading. Thank you, Rose. Hi. Um, so I'm going to read an essay that I wrote um, as a contribution to an anthology that uh, Sarah actually edited called Fieldwork, New Nature Writing from East Anglia. Um, so this text is about my return to Norfolk after 12 years um, away in London um, to write and kind of my return here to write my thesis about notions of femininity. Um, and I suppose this is a text about that text. Um, and I wanted to do, write something that rather than kind of thinking about women um, in a place or sometimes embodying a place, which often happens in literature, I wanted to evoke the space around, um, around a, a place. So the air, its climate, its breaths and mists. Um, something that's far harder to kind of pin down or grasp um, and I felt that this was what Norfolk was affording me was this was space um, so it's it's quite funny to come after Julia who also wrote about space around and and um, so it's called Stained Pink but now she is conspicuous among Lydian women as sometimes at sunset, the rosy-fingered moon surpasses all the stars and her light stretches over salt sea equally and flower-deep fields, Sappho, translated by Anne Carson. I came back to this place, another salt sea and flower-deep fields, to write about us or the me that has assumed you and you and her and them before, and the skies are stained pink, and the air is pink, and the wall is pink, and the water is pink. Nascent, born from the union of floating white, derobed blue, and fervent red, that dares reach out and touch, flint church, glass, wheat chaff. Colour is wavelengths, or more precisely, colour is stunted or long or penetrating lengths of light that we see or we don't see, as blue, violet, red, orange, each one ascertaining their own lifespan, like the flesh line on the palm of your hand. Blue light is short, it scatters like fractured artillery, collapses into mauve, violet, while red, red spectral purity finds its path and spreads, as if a flower like blood blots on a page. It is autumn, it is winter. In the east, the air along the path that the sunlight seeks is drier and cleaner, heaved in and out over the torn cliff edge and the fertile land, flat and broad and limitless. So that a low bloated sun casts its rays, red tips commune with aerosol mass of cumulus, cirrus, autocumulus, and projects something like transcendental ecstasy, spreading in saccharin and then drains. I rewatch old TV show credits of a blazing Californian sunset fronted by palm tree cutouts and silhouettes of surfers montaged with blocks of azure blue sea sky and images of sailing boats and pool houses and brilliant white SUVs. California, here we come, right back where we started from. But here, California, 
faces east, emerges with the sand and shingle of Scrapby to the north, and Caister on Sea to the south, and the land's edge is puckered with off-white caravans, so that the pink is underscored by a shoal, a field, plastic. While inland, in this quiet room, fabric walls, flint rock vista, it spreads silvery over the roofs and stone crenellations, reaches a dawn peach to rose, and later draws down into mauve and pales in lilac. The moon is like silver, writes Sappho. Of wavelengths and meaning and paper horizons, Etel Adnan writes, Working for years in this direction it led me to the suspicion that our mental world is an ongoing translation, that perception is a translating of the object of that perception, and that any thought that we may think to be primordial, spontaneous, is already an interpretation of something which precedes it and may even be of another nature, another stuff than thinking itself, a wavelength an it, which remains unknown, a translation of this it by an active filtering function of the mind. I translate these wavelengths, that spectral air, into pink and worry that she is a kind of osmosis of the past, in this assassination born of chaos. I watch her creep, rose, vermilion, blush, marking the breaking of day and coming of night, the copper slant of autumn, the golden renewal of Gregorian revolution, but she chooses her moments all fleetingness. This grey morning is less a spoke than a reminder that she is not fecund, flesh flake, nor hardened earth, mother earth, stagnant bog, bosom of the home, but a rippling shadow, waning light, ungraspable shapeshifter, changing her clothes or fickleness and layers. My eyes adjust and I gulp her, sugar high. Rosy fingered, Anne Carson writes, is used habitually by Homer to designate the red look of dawn, but Sappho inverts it. It is the moon who casts that redness. I think Sappho means to be startling, Carson writes, but I don't know how startling when she moves the epithet to a nocturnal sky. I imagine thorny skin like flesh chewed turret whips in the clouds or touching the serrated ridge of mountains in Dark Mesa with Pink Sky 1930 by George O'Keefe. Time of day indeterminate. This painting is another kind of inversion, or perhaps a diversion. Georgia O'Keeffe makes the valley and clefts, the material at the centre of the painting, shifting pink. The looming mountain ridge a pitched grey, and the sky, the space, an aerated pink coated white, as if the sun is retracting all the colour in those final throes of twilight. But it is O'Keeffe's strokes, Sappho's marks, those unknowable wavelengths that do the work. And then the pink pales over the sea and a huge full moon cut by electric cables. And I write, swollen and buoyant egg of silken white sealed in anachronistic pink and moven tails seeping into the line of blackened earth. There is a moment in Claire Dennis's surreal masterpiece, High Life, 2018, set in space, where the viewer seems to enter the inseminated stomach of a girl and the camera floats through her fleshy galactic cosmos, a misty place that spreads near infinitely to a darkness, a non-horizon. Stars puncture cellular layers of contoured air at points deepening to neon holes, and we are forced to reconcile an intimate, intimate experience with an external space, a violated womb as site of welding. From a becoming to an undoing, Annie Dillard recalls a sky over her beloved Tinker Creek after a shattered star. A rosy complex light fills my kitchen at the end of these lengthening June days. From an explosion on a nearby star eight minutes ago, the light zips through space, particle wave strikes the planet, angles on the continent and filters through a mesh of land dust. Clay bits, sod bits, tiny wind-borne insects, bacteria, shreds of wing and leg, gravel dust, grits of carbon and dried cells of grass, bark and leaves. Reddened, the light inclines into this valley over the green western mountains. It sifts between the pine needles on northern slopes and through all the mountain blackjack oak and hoar, whose leaves are unclenching one by one and making an intricate toothed and lobed haze. Her pink sky is an active disillusion, inclining, sifting through pine needles, haze making. I write, I wonder about the potential of nothing to start again. Hours pass, or they don't, 
and Dillard stops on a long road trip, asphalt blinded for styrofoam coffee. My mind has been a blank slab of black asphalt for hours, but that doesn't stop the sun's wild wheel. I set my coffee beside me on the curb. I smell loam on the wind. I pat the puppy. I watch the mountain. The ridges bosses, the hammocks sprout bulging from its side. The whole mountain looms miles closer. The light warms and reddens. The bare forest folds and pleats itself like living protoplasm before my eyes, like a running chart, a wildly sprawling oscograph on the present moment. The air cools, the puppy's skin is hot. I am more alive than all the world. I realize that to realize is to both awaken to and make of. At one of Colette's fictitious Parisian parties, the light from the setting sun touched the curtain, shone through the drawing room from end to end, and Irene's friends cried out in admiration, it's like fairyland, the sky's going pink. One of them was more honest, as she took in, with one glance, the Seine, the old drawing room, extended by a rustic dining room, the purple and silver curtains, the orange teacups and the wood fire. There's no justice in the world, she murmured vindictively. Real realizations can be dazzling, that there is no justice in the world, that, that she is more alive than all the world, that she is violated. But the reverse is also true. Each pink sky near transformational. The 10th of December 2019, 7.34 a.m. is too wild, too intensely layered to allude to some sort of meaning. Something broke and something opened, Dillard says with a creak at sunset. I filled up like a new wineskin. I breathed in air like light. I saw a light like water. Hours pass, or they don't, and I wake in her layers, brass sun, pink air, fire horizon, move with her, let her cloak me in her rose-coated arms and release me and dissolve. I crouch by the window, solitary and in the world, looking out towards our future. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so that concludes our third reading. It was so great to have such a range of different voices and different perspectives, so interesting. So I prepared a few questions that I wanted to start off with, but please any members of the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please write that down and I'll ask it as well. But if I can go back to uh, Kirsty, first of all, You've all spent time working as writers in East Anglia, and obviously, Kirsty, you, you studied at UBA. Um, could you say, was there something particular to the region that you found especially conducive for your own practice? And could you say what that is? Um, yeah, so I was at UEA, so that was kind of the practical reason why I found myself in Norwich. Um, but all the work I read tonight was, was written in Norwich, and it kind of came out of, um, I think being being influenced by Norwich as a place and, and Norfolk more broadly, um, going on a lot of walks um, and experiencing the sort of history and the kind of strangeness and oddness of the landscape, which for me felt very unusual to the rest of the country. I grew up in America, so being in, in Norfolk for me felt, um, it just felt different to what I was kind of always thought of as England. And I think by being in that kind of, strange place I felt really inspired to make strange work mm. and it, were you drawn to UEA because of the kind of history also of writing from Norfolk or from Norwich was that something that interested you yeah um, I was drawn to the place um, it has it's a very good program but I also just really was really uh, captivated by by Norfolk in particular um, I'd been there a few times and I just I really fell in love with Norwich and its history um, and it was just a place I really wanted to be and to do work in. Mm. And you would now, am I right in thinking you're based in Manchester now? Yes, I'm in Manchester now, yeah. And do you feel you're making different work now um, that you're in Manchester? Has that influenced your work in a different direction? I'm not sure. I think that I, I came up to Manchester during lockdown and, and I'm originally from up, up here. Um, so, but I, I feel like I'm not really here yet because of lockdown, I've not really been anywhere. So I feel like I'm still kind of in the Norwich headspace. That seems to be where I still think I am. Um, yeah. So I think time will tell. Okay, great, thank you. Can I just ask the same question um, to Julia? 
I mean, I, one thing I'm quite keen to kind of get at is if people feel there is a distinctive um, difference between Norfolk and Suffolk. I find it quite interesting that Wythe and, Wave, and Waveney are so sort of along the border, aren't you, Genevieve? Your activities kind of along the border. And obviously, Julia, you're, you're based in Suffolk, aren't you? Do you feel that Suffolk is somewhere that's distinctively shaped your, your work? Obviously, you've written a lot about it. Well, it has. I never meant to live in flat country. I always thought I was <laughs> in the mountains. But I've been here for more than 40 years, on and off, with a bit of kind of... And I think what's so interesting about Suffolk and Norfolk also, Norfolk is kind of bigger by the sea. It's always the sea that I'm drawn to. But with Suffolk, it's this thing that you, you don't have the mountains, but you have the clouds instead of the mountains. And that really is, I've always found it lovely to, as a way of thinking, to walk yeah. and to be looking, to be aware of this enormity above you, as opposed to the, it's like, in a way, if I think of it now, it's like claustrophobia when you're surrounded by mountains. So there's that. And with Norfolk and Suffolk, I don't know, I've just been to Norfolk for a, a way away for 24 hours. And, the sea is so much bigger. This is quite domestic. Here you're always looking towards Holland and Doggerland. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's always that sense that it's a, it's a shallow sea um, with a lot underneath it, whether it's all the, the buildings around Dunwich or, or um, Cove High, but also that it's you feel you could walk across, just given half a chance. Mm, yes, indeed. <laughs> And it, but also interesting, Kirsty alluded to that a moment ago. There's this sense of the quite the deep history as well. That seems to be an important theme in your work that you feel close to the past in 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 East Anglia. I suppose perhaps because it wasn't industrialized in the same way as other places. Has that been important to you? That feeling of being well, I, I, when I first was here, it was I, I did always like talking to the old boys and old girls when I first came there. Right? My idea of a good Sunday was to go on my bicycle and live in a farm then really remote farm and I'd go on my bicycle and just go and talk to old boys about the old days and that was fantastically interesting because they were shy, quiet, intern people because it was a shy, quiet, intern place at that time. And then since then, the history of it, I think it only started the last book I did before, Time Song, Threads, about this Norfolk fisherman. I'd done research always in other places. And with that one, I realized how I could research my own backyard, if you like. And that was the same with Time Song. That I was, that, that it was a lot of it just to do with meeting people and by chance at the beginning and then by arrangement later on when I felt I knew enough to meet people who knew stuff. And seeing how people connected particularly with the shoreline and the stories they had to tell. And this extraordinary thing along here that, that I haven't done it so much recently, but that you go for a walk and you come back with a bit of money. Um, <laughs> it's so it's so wonderful that this, and also other bits and pieces that it is this crumbling coast, this fragile crumbling crumbling coast, which holds its enormous history in it. And I found that completely hypnotic. The more I find out about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. meditation of stones. I'm not a bird person really. I always look down and I go walking with people who are bird people and they look up. It's to do with being short-sighted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Um, if I can come to Rose now and ask you the same question, because obviously you um, had, I think, grown up in this region and then you'd moved, moved away, as you mentioned, to London and then been drawn back again. And um, what was it that, that drew you back? Um... I mean, part of it was convenience and financial, but uh, the kind of the particulars of this region. One was was just that it was that I had it. It was a kind of for me a return and like a, a moment to stop and think about it as a my place of birth and those formative years and my experience. Um, of girl of girlhood, I guess, and then womanhood, and and that kind of journey, because that was very much what I was writing about, um, or interested in writing about. So the kind of um, its relationship, this the place's relationship to time, in a sense, was very important. But also um, 
in a broader sense, the kind of actually the, the kind of the openness and the expansiveness of the landscape, like we've everybody said, um, felt like me, felt like a kind of like a opportunity to breathe. It just felt like a breath or an inhalation that I had been lacking in London for 12 years. And it felt, um, I think you'll come on to it, but yeah, the kind of, the, the, the process of return as the process of healing um, became quite um, important. And yeah, and, and just kind of, um, also in terms of history, I've been, I kind of ended up, uh, I was living next to a, medieval church and I am now again living next to a medieval church in the centre of Norwich and um, I kind of have this growing interest in mysticism and religious women in East Anglia um, which has kind of um, definitely been bloated by by my situation and being here and the history that is surrounding me I guess. Great. Thank you. Well, that was a perfect segue into the next question there, as you've brought, mentioned healing. Um, so let's go on to that question, and I'll pose that to you first then, Rose. Um, so there's a theme of healing that seems to connect the work of all of um, the writers. One question that did strike me when looking at all of your work was whether you would describe the process of writing itself as being therapeutic or not. Um, so maybe if I ask you that first, Rose. Um, yeah, I think because I'm always drawn to the past and my and and sort of personal experience in my writing, however far I then reach out towards um, forms of culture or literature or whatever, that um, that the, the the process of writing sort of that like I alluded to becomes a kind of um, a, a state of sort of reflection or meditation um, that that is healing in itself um, because and also the idea of kind of like of, of ingesting or looking inwards to then move move forward so there's this kind of back and forth um, that I think writing allows for because it is trying to find a way out or a way forward, but it, but it often for me it feels like you need to you need to return first. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Can I, Kirsty? Can I ask you this same question? Because obviously, looking at your um, practice, obviously you've you've written a lot of really interesting things to do with illness and and pain and how you kind of articulate um, those kind of experiences. I find really interesting do you find the process of of writing about those things has that uh, has that been therapeutic or would you see it in that way or how do you how do you frame it um yeah i definitely think it is i think for me writing about difficult things because my work is so focused on um illness and the body and shame and and pain um things that are seen as shameful and sort of taboo writing is a way to kind of reckon with them and articulate them especially when you're told by society that you shouldn't talk about these things and they should they should be secret so i think it's quite a powerful act to kind of put them into words um, and I think something my work is really interested in is kind of the institution of, of medicine and also religion being I was brought up Catholic and then being someone from a young age who was kind of navigating the hospitals a lot. Um, I kind of had a lot of faith in these sort of power structures, these kind of institutions. Um, and then there came a point in my life when I got older and had to kind of reckon with that with the fact that there's a lot of misogyny inherent in, in both and they're not these kind of benevolent caring forces. Um, so I think writing for me has been a way to kind of interrogate both those things. Um, and I think that's healing. I think it's transformative. And I think it allows you to, I think working in the mode of kind of mysticism, spirituality, that kind of thing. Um, and, and I guess for me, working with feminist horror is a really interesting way to kind of wrestle with those sort of power, power structures. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I, it did strike me, I thought it was interesting recently, there's been a few 
well, the ones that spring to mind are Jen Ashford's Notes Made While Falling or mm -hmm. Sinead Clayson's Constellations, which are, have as their focus really talking about things, as you say, that might be considered not for polite conversation or, you know, people have to sort of grin and bear it or something. And just wonder, do you think it's a, an interesting time um, for writing by women to charting that territory, that kind of place that hasn't been talked about before, perhaps hospital beds and so on? Yeah, I think it really is. I think there's a big kind of um, uh, surge in writing like this. And I think that goes to show that from my experience of starting to write about these things and talk about these things is just how common they actually are. Um, and when you start talking about these things, you start to realise you're not alone with it. And it is really common. It's the sort of thing that for so long, no one's spoken about because we thought, you know, we're on our own and also no one wants to hear it. So for books like, like you say, Constellations and Notes Made While Falling, I do think they are really exciting books that are kind of leading the way and, and kind of encouraging other writers to kind of share and, and talk about these things that we've been told to sh shut up about, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the other side of this question that I wanted to pose to Julia was really in relationship to thinking about this idea of healing in relationship to grief and loss, because I think that seems to be one of the things that people connect most strongly with in, with your work, Julia, is how you um, have woven in aspects of your own personal autobiography in a way that um, is very moving. Um, have you found writing about loss and grief has been a, a a good way of working through those feelings for yourself. Somebody, somebody said to me the other day that all my books were just one continuous diary. <laughs> so <laughs> they go with this is kind of underlying hum of my own life and then whatever I'm writing about. So I have in the because it was a big event the, the, and because I'm getting older, so I'm aware of death. And then I had the loss of my husband, who I loved very much, and I was. But he was very um, um, straightforward about the fact that he had no choice but to die. He was very interesting about it. So it was an interesting discussion about the fact of death mm -hmm. with him. But I think for me, with writing, it has two functions. One is that the process of writing, the process of writing is a kind of companionship. Um, and I've always been, I suppose, a, a solitary child, as it were. I remain a solitary person in some ways. So that there's a companionship of, the, of actually following the process of a book. And there's also the, um, the, the, to me, always it seems that I only find out what I think or what I believe in once I've put it into words and put the words onto pages. That the thinking within the head is a very... Um, it goes in circles and sort of flaps about. But once you, so I don't know with a book what's going to emerge um, mm -hmm. until I've written it, as it were. And it's been, yes, I think these, that those through the time song was, was a wonderful excuse to find out things and to find consolation, I think, is what the thing was. It gave me consolation, just this meeting with the enormity of time and with the the small things that have a huge story to them. Um, so there was that. Yeah. yeah, that's wonderfully, wonderfully put. Thank you. So uh, another question that kind of interested me was how all of you have found the experience of, of lockdown and if that's caused you to reflect more on ideas of place, environment, well-being and so on. So, I mean, perhaps I can link this to one of the questions that's been posed by um, an audience member. This is from Polly Crosby. For all of you, do you feel that if you're not living in a place that you can't write about it so well, do you need an East Anglian hit to get you in that writing place again? So that was quite interesting that Kirsty mentioned, despite being in Manchester, you're mentally have been spending time in, in Norwich. Um, and I suppose that's an interesting thought is, is it mainly East Anglia that's your sort of mental landscape when you're writing? Would that be the case for, for you, Julia? Oh, no, not at all. No. This, is, this is very much, East Anglia was just a backdrop and I was always, um, for me, writing was always about going elsewhere okay. for a long, long time. So that, that I, I used, when I was, whether I, you know, I did all kinds of books where I, I part of the, the pleasure of the book was going so I went to the deserts of Australia or to St. Helena or to 
Spain or whatever it was, but I was, I, I, it was a revelation to me that I could write about being here. Yeah. It, that was a turnabout, a new, a new thing. Um, so that I was kind of rooted here, but not looking around so much until recently. Mm. And, and before that, I, and now I have just did a big trip, just got back sort of 10 minutes before lockdown, as it were. And that trip is far away, and, you know, it was a far away place. But I do find that lockdown, I, I'm getting a kind of dialogue between being here, like a kind of journal, and then going off in the thought of the place that I was in, which was far, far away and unknown to me in so many ways. Mm. So it's it's a, it's the route, and I am I do get more and more fond of it. I think I feel more and more that I'm rooted in where I am mm. and fond of it. In the, in the, oh no, that's too passive. Um, I really like. It. I really like the area, um, and that's that's got stronger. Yes, I used to think that I was a kind of passenger pigeon just passing through, but clearly not so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. What about you, Kirsty? What 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 is it that you think that kind of mentally transports you to Norwich? I think um, I think a lot of my writing is kind of not really based anywhere. Maybe by it being sort of prose poetry and it being sort of uh, touching on kind of fairy tales or, or sort of horror type things um, so it's not really based anywhere but what I think I do is that I kind of maybe consciously or not consciously borrow elements and, and factors from the from places um, and there's something there's something about Norwich that I think I borrowed quite heavily from partly all this work was written while I was in Norwich um, and I think that it's just such a unique place um, that it's, um, it's hard to kind of shake it off even when you're even when you've left yeah i mean one thing that we haven't really kind of developed much or spoken about much is this idea of mythology which rosie did touch upon it in talking about living next to um churches and obviously kirsty in your reading you did talk about fawns and centaurs and other things i myself have a kind of feeling of norwich as having quite strong um magical feelings in some parts of the city and obviously you know, there's some very kind of um, famous mystical um, people associated uh, with the city as well. I mean, has that been, Rosie, is that something that you feel you've felt more strongly since coming back to the city? Have you appreciated it more um, in recent years? Yeah, I think definitely, you know, it's funny when I, when I left when I was 17, I just wanted to get out and I wasn't really, uh, you know, I wanted to go somewhere else and experience that. And it really, it is, um, sounds a bit naff, but yeah, it, it is since coming back that I've, um, that I, but I think it's also about where you are in your life and like a, a slowing down or a, um, a, a sort of seeking some sort of like spiritual, personal, spiritual um, healing or comfort. Um, that perhaps you're not so in tune with when you're 17. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that. And I think it's interesting in relation, um, the kind of, the idea of of mythology as well that, that came up in Kirsty's, um, in relation to place is quite interesting because, um, and in fact pain, because I, I talk quite a lot in my thesis about um, mythology and the kind of, the relationship between the land and women as sort of conquered and pillaged and passive and guy kind of the um the notion of gaia from greek mythology um uh, as being mother earth and again the kind of like pain that she endured um so i, I thought that's that's a kind of interesting connection as well that um that I, I seem to keep coming back to in different forms of mythology and um, and that relationship of um, and and the other thing I think is interesting is that um, with anchor with the kind of there's quite a there's a lot of interest at the moment in in anchoresses and anchorites but the kind of the you know someone like Julian of Norwich she wrote she was a writer as you know that that was what she did she's the first English first women writer in the English language and so her kind of documentation of her spiritual experience experiences um felt um quite revelatory to me and I didn't I didn't know that much about them before I returned um 
and a kind of this again that idea of solitude and being solitary as a writer um i mean is just epitomized in her work and being in a you know locked up in a cell doing the thing that she wanted to do so that was an interesting uh yeah yeah definitely that links very perfectly onto another question from the, the audience members are seem very insightful and they're posing very good questions here so we've got one from ben hi and to everyone the personal and even the painful in relationship to the landscape is a powerful theme through all of your work is this an element that's particularly significant to east anglia i mean obviously we framed this discussion in terms of women in place but uh, obviously one author who i think has cast quite a shadow is w uh, Siebold, you know and his uh, obviously quite melancholic <laughs> writings about about east anglia i find it quite be interested to know um people's feelings about this idea about the personal and the painful i think i've sort of experienced east anglia has been quite a joyful landscape i really liked um julia's description of not having the mountains but having the clouds mm -hmm. and this, this idea of space that has come up quite a few times in the discussion as well i've i've never felt it to be oppressive here the experience of space i've always sort of felt it quite quite liberating but be interested to know and um, you know if, if anybody has a response to that that really interesting question from ben there um whether per the personal and even the painful in relationship to the landscape's powerful theme through all your work is this an element that's particularly significant to east anglia i think there's something very interesting with east anglia that follows on what rosie was saying on this this um the, the fact that it was such a an intensely religious area in the past and it's such a wealthy area i mean like kohai with the great big town in kohai but now all you've got is a, you know is lots of feet and not much else and but that there was this you have this this sense of a, of a spirit of a rather bleak spirituality with enormous great churches ruined half of them or or exquisite but sort of not much used and they give a kind of of, of dimension of thinking to somebody like me who's not religious mm. in the ordinary certainly not you know in church going religious but i go to the churches for what they hold mm. and that and they also seem oddly to be part of the landscape you know partly because they fall into the sea and disappear into it that way like it then but also there's something about these enormous buildings in in rather bereft areas which is very means that they become part of the land and the land itself, as well as the repeat, it's this freedom of of space that lends itself towards a certain sort of thinking. There's a particular walk. If you go from here, you go to to um, out from from towards where Warburswick is, but you walk through woods, and then you suddenly are thrown out into a into the marsh, into the into the reed beds. And every time again, it takes my breath away. It's, it's you know that it's. And there's not many places where you have quite such a instant access to that transition and to that shock of of sudden space after the woods. Yeah. Mm. So a nice comment here from Maddie O. East Anglia, space and an island, not en route to anywhere. Mm -hmm. Does this ring true for you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i think that is quite interesting that you have to sort of want to come here don't you mm -hmm. it's it, it's true it's not on the, it's not on route to anywhere doesn't does that chime with anybody else the sort of ideas of it being kind of out on a on a limb slightly this region yeah i think that i was thinking that in terms of the pain and the personal and the pain question actually yeah, yeah. Yeah. that almost it, it's remoteness is a site it i don't relate east anglia to pain as such but a kind of endurance mm -hmm. there's this kind of feeling of um exposure and endurance that you might need in as a, in terms of the kind of physical landscape and um how incredibly exposed you can feel which is sort of um sometimes it can feel very bleak or it can feel um quite um 
hard to digest you know there it, it's not it's not chocolate box dorset rolling hills you know and 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 it owns that but it but that comes with its own kind of um yeah i i, I was just interested in that idea of, of endurance rather than pain specifically i mean this is an interesting moment to have this conversation with the equinox happening on monday because i feel that we're now you feel the seasons quite strongly in east anglia partly yeah. I think because it's so flat so we're noticing the sky changing quite a lot at the moment aren't we and mm. as you to kind of say that, that you know perhaps you experience that more than you would living in a major city where that where everything is kind of on all the time i think there is more of a sense of seasonality um in east anglia perhaps it's linked to farming and other kind of natural cycles perhaps what do you think kirsty you did you feel like East Anglia was a good place to kind of come to, not to retreat, but maybe that was, what was it that you said something, Rosie, a way out or a, a way, or I don't know. a way out, a way of return or, you know, some kind of opportunity for scrutiny perhaps that you might not get in a place such as London or New York that might be very um, busy and, and vibrant all the time. Um, yeah, definitely. I was living in London until I, I moved to Norwich. Um, and incidentally, when I was in Norwich, I, I do associate it with, with pain. I had a lot of surgeries when I was there, just kind of, you know, it just sort of happened. Um, so I spent a lot of time kind of going in, coming out, recovering. Um, and I think that although that's painful, it was the ideal place to do that in. And I've always felt like it's quite lucky um, to be in a place that is kind of out the way and it is um, a sense, there's just a different sense. I think time moves differently there. It's slower. It's... Um, and I do think the sky and the kind of landscape has a lot to do with that. This sort of like time, your experience of time passing. And I think in my experience, my relationship to kind of the landscape, it felt quite healing and um, isolated in a sort of great sense of solitude, which I think I needed at the time to recover. Um, so I think it was kind of the best place to be for that reason. So I feel quite lucky to have that experience. Mm. It's quite transformative. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's that's a lovely thing to hear. That's good, and that reminds me of what Julia was saying about this thing about in times when time is both longer and shorter than I thought possible, which is quite interesting. This kind of idea of sort of telescoping, and um, you know, I suppose everybody will have had the experience of maybe having a day out on a beach or somewhere in East Anglia where it's it's not just a single day, but it might feel quite restorative in it in itself because of that experience of, of the outdoors. Um, there's some other sort of really interesting question, which is it's quite a complex question, but I think everybody will have something interesting to say about this. This is the question from Brian. What for each of you is the difference between poetry, prose, poems, <laughs> and essays? Yeah. <laughs> I think because I, I love prose poetry and I write a lot of it so I think for me prose poetry you can um, kind of borrow things that you like from prose borrow things you like from poetry maybe it's a bit cheeky to work in that genre and avoid the things that I don't like in, in both um, so I think that's why I like to work in that mode and I also think it's it's interesting because you can be quite um, withholding um, and kind of mysterious, for lack of a better word, in that sort of structure. Um, and I think that's quite enticing. Yeah, yeah, interesting. What what do you what do you think, Julia, about this? About the difference between prose poetry, poetry, and, and essays? It's very curious because I never thought that I I don't really write poetry, but I've done two books of poems. But they, they, I like the, and I've also got the Miss Time song had these, these short, shortened pieces, which are sort of songs. And I think for me, it's just the different vehicles, the different, as it were, music of the words changes, depending on how you structure it. Mm. And so that, that I found it more and more interesting in trying to get a kind of immediacy to use, in some instances, to use something like a certainly very free poetry. And essays, I think the whole thing overlaps. It's like I seem to sort of drift between fiction and, and non-fiction and poetry and prose. But I think it doesn't matter that, that it's a kind of um, 
it's whatever whatever holds what it is you want to say but it's nice to see that merging possibility and i was thinking that rosie's prose is like poetry and um that that you know each of us has has got, has that kind of overlap i think all of us in our writing have an overlap of, of form mm. um which is just because the point is you want to communicate what you want to communicate and you're going to use anything you possibly can to make that accessible um, yeah. And the form of poetry can tighten it and hold it sometimes. Um, that's a bit of a waffly answer. Sorry. No, I think that was a really good answer. I mean, it's a complex question, isn't it? But it, it did make me kind of think a bit about um, different textures of writing. Yeah. That there might be obviously in a more essay form, it might be more factual, it might be more footnoted, and um, but then there's a different kind of truth that you might access through poetry that's not to do with facts and figures but is more to do with um a striking image for example like in Kirsty's poem where she talked about unzipping from your body such mm -hmm. a kind of striking mm -hmm. image that mm -hmm. that would take you to a place of understanding much more perhaps than pages of, of notes mm -hmm. about um you know female um bodily functions or pain or you know it was very vivid so mm -hmm. i find it quite interesting that there might be different tools that you might use in order to tap into those um, different mm -hmm. registers, different textures. Really interesting. What, Rosie, what do you think about this, this question about the differences between prose poetry, poetry and essays? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like we said, there's more and more we're kind of, we, or particularly in like in postgraduate Kind of academia um, within like an arts institution it's very much trying to break down those um, the categorizations and think of form as a bit more fluid um, and I think for me I, I struggle between a kind of like an education where I think about footnoting and I think about a citation and a kind of desire to, to like run free with things and so um, I think for me the the essay form sometimes isn't it doesn't really um, do what it says on the tin but it it allows me to draw together lots and lots of things that I love um, across different disciplines and I think that's that's what I feel it allows me and to kind of with a critical eye and to um, to look for like patinations or something with those things and the reason why I, why I'm wanting to draw them or link them all together. Um, and in terms of poetry, I just feel completely ill-equipped to, 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 to write it. Um, so I don't, uh, <laughs> um, or badly. Um, but for me, that there's like a lyricism to that, to poetry often that, um, and again, what Julie was saying around kind of like actual kind of form and syntax that, um, that I really admire, but I don't um, have a huge amount of experience in writing or haven't practiced hard enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Melinda has asked the question that I was thinking of posing, my, posing myself. Um, the, this event was called Women in Place. Do you perceive that women as writers relate differently from men's place? I think that's a really, really good question. We might need another day to answer perhaps, <laughs> but maybe we can have a stab at, at answering that question. What do we think about this? I would say it's quite likely. Um, I think in my own work, I'm trying to write from a place that's curious and empathetic towards nature and landscape and, and the environment um, and, and animals. Um, and I wonder if, I don't, I think wanting to, for, so my own work wanting to, look at themes of kind of um, patriarchal violence and control, which in medicine is, you know, historically medicine has seek to kind of control and dominate the female body. I think it's quite a sort of light bulb moment when I connected that to kind of landscape and, and ecology, you know, with patriarchal capitalist power structures trying to control and dominate the planet we live on. There's a lot of um, parallel there. So I, yeah, I think women will maybe in not always but inherently be a bit more empathetic and curious about about the the world mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's that's interesting. I mean, it has to be there has been discussion about how there's a certain kind of nature writing which is characterised as being like white and middle class. Um, I wouldn't name any authors, but I'm sure no, we can, yeah. think, we can yeah. think of a few. Um, and certainly, like the literature we mentioned earlier about pain, it feels like there has been quite an upsurge in writing um, about nature by women and also by people of colour recently, which has been really interesting to just try and, you know, the, the genre is much more di diverse than it might appear at first at first glance. I don't think anybody would want to make sweep, you know, sweeping statements about differences in approach. Um, but I think there is that thing about um, thinking of, uh, you know, if you might see things differently, if perhaps, you know, you're a young woman or an older woman or, um, you know, a, a, a teenager or whatever it might be that that might colour your experience of nature. What do you think, Rose, do you think that women as writers relate differently from men to plays? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've written quite a lot about um, taking it slightly. I mean, there is, I guess there's lots of distinctions to be made around what place is, because there's also this, this idea of a women's place, as in the home, as in domesticity, which is like a whole other day week month or whatever um that we'd need but so um i do think that we relate differently um to a, to a sense of of place um and, and i think there are kind of useful and um and destructive parallels to be drawn between women and place and that idea of passivity that I was talking about before but also there's this great light and thinking about brilliant female nature writers there's um Annie Dillard who I who I referenced in my essay uh has this brilliant quote where she says um silence is nature's one remark and this idea of kind of this this idea of of sort of muteness that I think um, often gets associated with women or is the reality of lots of women still um, is an interesting one and that kind of what does that silence say um, yeah so mm. I'm not I'm not going to carry on <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think that's interesting because like silence is something that you know we haven't really touched upon that but I think that that's one of the things that is distinctive about this this place East Anglia mm -hmm. is that you can have an experience of a kind of quiet here that you might not have in other places and how that um, quiet or that silence might how you choose to fill it is kind of mm -hmm. interesting you know whether mm -hmm. you're with it and you're I really like the way in Julia's reading she was observing and we mm -hmm. were able to be there listening and observing with her and I think that that quality of being able to still yourself and, and, and listen to the landscapes really something special about this about this place and I did perceive that in all of your writing that the 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 you're so perceptive and so observant and that really came through really clearly but in such different styles so really really enjoyed all of your work um yeah so there was there was one question that was um asked right back at the beginning by um Polly but it's really it's a question um mainly aimed at Julia that was just about what initially fascinated you about Doggerland I'm, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can all hazard a guess. It's pretty fascinating, isn't it? But um, maybe if there's anybody that's watching that's not completely au fait with what Doggerland is, maybe you could give us a quick pressy of of, of what, what, what Doggerland is. Exactly. Was. It, it's actually Doggerland. Always, it's a it's a recent name for a land mass that has quite recently got drowned. I mean, it's, it's a nice thought to think that that the whole continent of Europe from Sweden right down to France was one landmass with England. And it was only with the end of the last ice age that, that the, the division, we think of ourselves as this kind of damn island with all our island mentality, but it's only with the last ice age. So it's only the end of Doggenland came as of the land that joined us with Europe, um, only happened 8,000 years ago, a mere 8,000 years ago. Um, and before that, that it was, you know, people walking across. So there was a lot of the, the, the human artifacts saying you find all the mammoths, just this this, this inter this this walking across from the, the landmass of Europe to here was no problem. Um, and 
I don't know, what else do I think about? I mean, it's, it's just so fascinating to think that there is a landscape under the sea that's relatively recently covered. Um, and also the fact that now with our climate change, that in that time, which is a parallel time of, of, of climate change, which is the end of the ice age, the speed once it starts taking place, so that in the in the first when, once the um, Dogoland starts to go under, it's two meters of sea level rise every hundred years, and we go on about you know a centimeter here or there. But actually, if the thing really kicks in and that you have the, the big sort of shifts of tectonic plates shifting and ice things underwater melting, then we're in for a lot more complicated stuff than we project. So that was, is that what Doggerland is? And it was called Doggerland because of Dogger, one woman named it in the 1990s, Doggerland, from Dogger, Dogger Bank, and the fact also the dogwood tree, which had grown in on Dogger Bank Island and also in a lot of the kind of landscape the dog land was. Yeah. And that was how, and the dog, the, the, the dog wood, which was used for making daggers. So she had a lot of nice things of choosing that name. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's come to mind recently, obviously, has just been that although the climate change was declared an emergency in, by many countries, people didn't really stop um, driving and flying and doing mm. other things until we've had the um, pandemic. I think that's been one thing that's been interesting to reflect on is that it is possible to change our behavior. But, we, but to some extent, people need to really believe that it is, it is an emergency. And mm. in, in some ways, I sort of think that the recent um, lockdown experience or the pandemic experience did show some possibilities of living in a slightly different way that was that was interesting even as it's such a a difficult time in many ways for lots of people. Let's well hope anyway, I think that, that more or less brings us to the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's you know there's always um positive things in every situation and I think you've all shone a light on some really interesting aspects um of nature and what nature can can give us creatively. So thank you very much. For that and thank you very much for everyone that was here that posed all the questions such good questions uh, that um really brought a lot to the discussion so that was brilliant thank you very much we'll pass right. over to genevieve now yeah thank you ever so much for our, our four speakers thank you um sarah for chairing the discussion and rose julia and kirsty for for your readings and really insightful thoughts um, from healing to pain and lockdown to well-being, doggerlands and then ending on our climate future. That was really, really insightful. Um, so thank you ever so much. I can also see lots of thank yous in the in the chat. So it's really lovely to hear that and see that people um, enjoyed themselves. So um, you know, do do look up our writers and, and support their, their work. It's very generous of them to, to give their um the time this evening so thank you ever so much um so that draws us to a close um so um thank you to the audience for joining us um as i said this um is going to be recorded um so you'll be able to um catch up on, on it on youtube and we'll post it on our um social media and um, we'll link to our our writers this evening as well um so thank you everyone and um, on with your evenings <laughs> and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank um, you. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye